everyone, and a big welcome to the Living With SMA podcast. We talk about all things spinal muscular atrophy related, but topics discussed are not exclusively for individuals with SMA, so there should be something here for everyone. We also do things differently. For starters, our charity SMA UK uses different hosts, and everyone involved gets a final say in the creative process of making these episodes. We cut through the jargon, and the content is accessible for everyone. All the stories are individual, and we are committed to sharing as many different perspectives as we can for our listeners. So if you're listening to this and have a burning desire to talk about a particular subject, then please reach out to us on our social media channels, or send us a quick email. And remember, no topic is off the table. If there is something the SMA community wants to talk about, this is the place. We really hope you enjoy the podcast and please do connect with our charity and share your comments online. And let us know what you think. From all the team at SMA UK, thank you for listening. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Living with SMA podcast. Now, for today's episode, we are we're in the run up to summer, which means one thing. It is time for gigs. It is music. It is festival time. And we thought, what better way to uh, embrace this upcoming season by talking about music festivals and gigs from the perspective of accessibility and disability. So that is exactly what we're going to be covering on today's podcast. So thank you very much for joining us. Now, let's start with the usual introductions before we get into everything. Um, I might as well kick things off myself. My name's Ross Lannan. I'm going to be your host today. I will be chipping in and out with a few musical opinions as well. So don't judge me for my terrible music tastes, please. Um, So yeah, I'm Ross. I'm 30. I have SMA, I am from Cornwall, and my favourite music artist, which I would like you all to announce your favourite artist at the end, um, I'm going to say my favourite music artist is the band Bastille, so there we go. Uh, Molly, I'll hand over to you for your intro. Um, I'm Molly, I've got SMA, type 3, um, I'm from Devon, I live in Liverpool for university, and my favourite artist would be Taylor Swift. What a choice. <laughs> so we'll introduce our next guest, Jordan, Jordan, who has just uh, pulled a face as if you've stolen her uh, favourite artist. Not quite, not quite. So my name's Jordan and um, I have person in type 2 and I live in Gloucestershire, but I went to war on Worcestershire all the um, time. And my favourite artist is actually like the opposite of Taylor Swift. Um, young Blood, Pop Trevor. Oh, Okay, very nice. I I approve of both of your suggestions. To be honest, I like a bit of Taylor, and I do like a bit of Youngblood. So, hey, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a good session today. We're we're on a, a similar vibe, so that's good. Uh, right, guys. So for today's podcast, I thought we would uh, start things off with a little bit of a bit of a game, a bit of a quick fire round, just so we get to know each other's music tastes a little bit more and so our listeners can get to know our um, likes and dislikes a bit more as well so I'm going to give you some categories and you just need to give me little quick fire one word answers Um, I'll get involved with it as well and we'll go round so first category favourite genre of music I personally I'm I like a bit of like acoustic. I like acoustic pop kind of music. That's my vibe. Uh, Jordan, what about you? Uh, Pop punk. Oh, nice. And Molly? Um, I feel like I'd agree, like acoustic pop, like cheesy pop sometimes. Cheesy pop. You can't go wrong, can you? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, next category. I want to know what is the best gig you've ever been to? Okay, uh, I'm going to say best gig I've ever been to was probably Adele at the O2. That was probably my favourite. Jordan? I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it was a young the concert that I went for. And it's the person who came out into the audience at by the disabled seating area and climbed the barriers behind me. Cool. I mean, you can't really top that, to be <laughs> fair, can you? <laughs> 
Molly? Um, probably Eurovision, actually. I live in Liverpool, so Eurovision last year was in Liverpool, um, and that was insane. Oh, I love that. See, right, cool. there's so much there's so much we can delve into on this, uh, but let's keep the, the categories going for now. Um, what is the worst concert you've ever been to? This is a bit controversial. Uh, I, I would say mine is probably... I went to a cider festival once and local in Cornwall and I'm pretty sure it was like the Wurzels were playing or something like that and yeah it was completely mud ridden it was not a good experience so that was my worst yeah. Jordan oh dear um, I think it might have been Hollywood Undead but it wasn't them it was their support act you were completely different genre very sorry wasn't cool yeah. Okay, Molly. Mine would actually be Harry Styles. Very controversial, I think. Not him himself. A the rumor. accessibility around it was horrendous. Oh, okay. I mean, you are going to get inundated with hate after this. I know. For... Oh, no, he was amazing. I still <laughs> love him, but just the access around, yeah, was awful. And I think it made the experience not as good. Yeah. And I think that's probably something as we delve into this topic later you know yeah. the ac access can play a key role to the overall enjoyment and experience mm -hmm. of of a gig but yeah, yeah good luck fighting off the uh the directioners as as they say <laughs> um final final category in our quick fire round what is your dream concert so someone that you've not seen live yet but you want to i'm gonna say it's the 1975 for me good choice Jordan, oh my God. she's thinking. Hey, I don't like, no. no? Maybe I want to go to Eurovision, but that's an option. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tick it off the list. Molly, you know what, what about you? Dream concert. Mine would be Taylor Swift. Taylor. Wolverine. Nice. Very nice. Okay, well, that was good. I feel like that's a good way for people just to get to know our little taste a bit more. Um, brilliant. So... We're talking about accessibility on the podcast today. And when it comes to music events, festivals, things like that, I think probably the best place to start is at the very beginning. So let's talk about actually getting tickets. So we haven't made it to the concert yet, but let's talk about the process of getting tickets. Uh, Molly, let's start with you. What has your overall experience been like when it comes to just getting tickets? Um, I think it very much depends on the venue. I think some places um, on Ticketmaster, you can just select an accessible ticket and then it's very easy because you just kind of go through the same process as everyone else, you know, except like get the accessible ticket and then send in kind of your proof of disability. It's very easy. But um, we've had big issues when it comes to sort of phoning up the venue and getting tickets because quite often if it is a high demand for tickets, um, the phone lines just you can't get through on them. So like for Taylor Swift, for example, we were trying to get tickets for Anfield mm -hmm. um, and I think we phoned up like over 300 times just to try and get through to the accessible line because there was just no way of getting through and it was the only way you could get a ticket um so for us we find it a lot harder when you can't just buy them online and you have to phone up the venue because they just you can just never get through and it just takes hours and hours and by the time you have all the tickets are sold out so that's been our main problem absolutely and, and jordan is this something that you've found as well because i get so frustrated with the fact that certain places don't sell accessible tickets online i would much rather sit in an online queue and and feel like i'm getting somewhere than having to be on a phone uh just feel like you're waiting for ages plus there's a, there's a fee that often comes with with phone calls as well um how's your experience been i'm in the generation where i also hate making phone calls so <laughs> anyway i can avoid that um but i've had this like same sort of problem would it be different depending on the venue um, and sometimes the size of the venue as well some smaller venues are better because they'll let you just send them in more they'll sort out your accessible tickets and everything like that um, whereas the other ones have also the on keys I also find there's a lot of problems with the way that the settings are on the ticket systems so you can book an accessible seat with a companion next to it but it won't let me put it into the spare companion seat. So 
it needs a lot of iron in that pepper. It definitely does. And I I completely agree with the point you made there. It's a really good point that often it's the smaller venues that are actually better at these, which is quite surprising really, because you imagine the bigger organizations, the one that's the ones that use your ticketing giants such as Ticketmaster, you would expect the smaller ones to be behind the times. But actually, that's not always the case. So it's a really good point. And also, how do you guys feel about the fact that you almost have to prove your disability to be able to get tickets? Molly, you mentioned there about, you know, some venues you have to send proof of a, of a benefit or, or some kind of disability proof afterwards, which just involves additional admin and almost a bit of an anxiety as well, because there's not like an instant, you don't have confirmation of your ticket, do you? You send your your proof and then you have to wait yeah no completely i think it makes the whole process a lot more scary and a lot less exciting i think because anyone else obviously just buys a ticket and they have the excitement of like oh i just got tickets to like see my favorite artist and it's so exciting but i think as you said when you have to wait to get the confirmation back after you sent your proof that can take you know a good month or so to come back and i think by the time it has you've kind of <laughs> forgotten about it a little bit and so the excitement it's just not the same when you just receive an email to say confirmation i just don't think it's the same experience at all. Yeah, I'm 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 almost scared that I don't want to wait another day for a yeah, reply think... or, or weeks because what if my ticket goes to somebody else in that time? You never, never know, isn't it? So Complete that, is, that is definitely something that I think needs some improvement on. Um Jordan, we've had some questions come in from our um from the, the online community as well in regards to accessibility at music events and we're talking about booking tickets here and we've had a question come in from somebody saying do i have to pay for pa tickets now what how would you sort of answer this question and what has your experience been in regards to um pa support at gigs well it's still very much up to the venue whether they'll give you the companion ticket for free but in my experience, that is more venues than not. Um, most venues are happy to give you that ticket. Um, just drawing on the previous question as well, um, the access card scheme has been fantastic for getting my PAs in. Um, I only needed to send up my proof of disability one to the main company, and in my application, I said that I wanted what I needed for a carer with me. And on my card, it's got a little plus one. So if the wedding accepts that, they can then also book with a panel ticket with it. Oh, that's that's actually really interesting. I I've been to so many gigs over the years, but I've I've never heard of the access card scheme before. So I'm sure there's many other people out there as well who are not familiar with it. So is that something you can just apply for online? Is it? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if there's a fee with it, but it's definitely worth doing the panels because um, a lot of different places use it. Theatres are starting to use them as well. And you can also connect your card to some of the ticket website so that when you log in to your account, wheelchair seats are viewable where they wouldn't be for regular patrons. Brilliant. See, this is one of the perks of doing the podcast because you learn something from from someone at, at some point. So brilliant. So yes, that was one of the community questions. Do I pay for a PA? I think it's fair to say nine times out of ten, the majority of venues you are um you will get it's usually just the one pa that i'm aware of i know some people require additional pas and then that becomes again a, a topic for discussion between yourself and the venue but nine times out of ten the majority of venues are pretty good at um giving you uh, a free companion ticket uh, which is which is great so so we've we've discussed some of the process of booking tickets before we even get to the event as well i'm setting the scene for you guys now we're, we're driving to the event or we're being dropped off at the event accessibility parking it's it's a big thing um jordan you're laughing now i'm not sure are you a driver yourself or whether you've been dropped off at gigs but yeah ha how's that been for you um, i'm a driver myself and I will choose a venue 
based on its parking. I know that's answering, but um, I've had it happen on multiple occasions where I've par- parallel parked outside and somebody's parked behind me because after a concert it gets really busy and I've not been able to get into my vehicle for like a while or something. Um, so parking is a very important thing for me. I do try to look ahead on the accessible website. It's called it accessible. Um, it's a so I'll, I'll get in touch with the venue and say, and just space where I'm not going to park behind what, what you suggest. Yeah. No, that, I think that's every uh, wheelchair user's worst nightmare as a driver of somebody parking right behind you and you can't get in and out of the boot. Um, I think a lot of us are in, in the similar position there. But parking is a, is a big part of um, the experience. I, I agree. I, I feel like if there's not nearby parking or well-equipped accessible parking, it 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 does affect the experience, doesn't it? And as well as that, just I just feel like every music venue is a nightmare to get out of. I think regardless of whether you're having an accessible vehicle as well, it, it, Molly, you're nodding your head there. Queues just trying to get out of these venues is a bit of a nightmare, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, Matthew, I was, as I said earlier about um, Tari Styles, we had a really bad experience there because the main way out is up a flight of stairs and they just decided to close the ramp off and they weren't letting anyone up the ramp. And even when we were there being like, we have no other way out of the venue, they said that I could go up and then the two people I was with had to basically stay at the bottom of the ramp and wait to queue up the stairs and they wouldn't let them come up with me. My friend even got her hand just kind of holding back of my chair to make sure we didn't get separated and kind of got her hand like slapped off my chair uh, wasn't allowed to stay with me we just had such like horrendous experience the tube station as well at Wembley isn't accessible so again trying to get out and then try and find a taxi and everything it just took us and I know it takes everyone hours to get out of Wembley but it just took us the most ridiculous amount of time and just the experience around it just was not not ideal at all because they just yeah closed everything off and it was just they did handle it well afterwards they actually gave us free tickets to go back and watch him which was amazing um, and it was a lot better that time but yeah the first really? experience was just not a pleasant one <laughs> no and it is shocking that this is like still happening in in this yeah. day and age where accessibility can be so bad but yeah. we don't want this to be a complete negative washout of of because there are a lot of good experiences out there as well unfortunately there doesn't seem to be uh, a consistency across um accessibility at music venues for example it couldn't have come at a a better or worse time i actually went to a concert a couple of nights ago at a venue close by to me and i've been to this venue hundreds of times over the years often to watch like more more sort of theater shows or the odd play um but it was the first time i actually went there for a music concert didn't think anything more of it like i said been there loads of times the the access has always been great seating has already always been great but it is more of a theater, so it's not like there's no raised platforms or anything like that. So I, I get to the um the the gig this week thinking it's a seated venue, everyone's gonna be sat down, it'll be fine. No, nope. song number one comes on, everybody stands up. The wheelchair space is right at the very back of the room, so could not see a single thing, which I come home thinking I might as well have just put the C D on and listened to the to that artist um, from the comfort of my home because I couldn't see them. It was completely pointless. But it's frustrating, isn't it? As wheelchair users, we're often a, a last thought when it comes to accessibility at these events. So that's a big pet pet hate of mine is um, people standing up in front of you and not often having an awareness or a respect for wheelchair users. I'd love to hand over to you guys now and know and ask you a little bit more about what the common accessibility challenges are that you guys face. Uh, so, Jordan, when you go to a gig, is there like a a common access issue that you find? I've had a lot of people standing like in front of walls. Where um, I, there was one concert I went to, it's headed to walk off, and everyone stood up dancing, and we were being told to sit down for on the balcony. You're not meant to. She stops the concert and tells the security officer telling them to sit down. It was so embarrassing for her to 
Yes. Your stable people at the back are like, uh, hello, I'll be back. <laughs> um, so that is a nightmare. Um, and also, this isn't one of my experiences, but if the Ben uses this and that, this break, um, then that can be awful. I know uh, one of the SMA teams latched for a lift broke and they were upstairs and they used some reward sort of like door ramp system to try and get them downstairs safely. But things like that can go wrong at all the time. Um, yeah. Well, those yeah. are my biggest problem. Yeah, I agree. And when it comes to sort of music events, uh, when it, a lot of places do have a specific area for people who may be in wheelchairs or who have any kind of other access requirements where it is a generally it is a raised platform but again the inconsistency sometimes you can go to an venue a venue and the raised platform be amazing it's spacious you they allow you to have you know your your pa to be with you as well like sat beside you other times the pa is told to there's not enough space on the platform and things like that which is frustrating molly what's been your experience in terms of um general accessibility and wheelchair platforms um i think the thing that always gets me with wheelchair platforms is the only having one person with you and obviously that being your carer because i find a lot of the time if i'm you know i'm good friends with my carer we go to a lot of different things together but there's times where i want to also bring one of my friends from uni or a friend from home or something and then having the issue of like you can only have one person with you is not really fair because everything everyone else again can you know you go in a big group of friends to a concert um, and we've had cases where we've gone oh well is it okay if we just don't go on the viewing platform and we stand you know right next to it so we're still sort of in the safe area um and i can sort of stay with all of my friends and the sort of the battle you have to have to be able to not go on the platform um is just a bit of a pain as well because again if you want to go on it that's great but obviously there's a lot of people that don't want to just sit up in the crowd um so we've had a lot of problems around sort of being able to stay as a group and not being you know two of you on the platform and the rest of you kind of in the crowd has been a big problem that i found exactly and if you're a party of three you're screwed yeah. because one person is always going to be left on yeah. their own, aren't they? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and it's I, always a, pub, a bit of a battle, but yeah. And I, I've had many experiences. I'm sure you guys have seen it over the years as well. Where I get frustrated, where I think sometimes people presume that the platform is just like a a privilege that anyone can use. Like all, you know, you've seen. I've seen all sorts of buggies and parenting and all sorts going on on the platform, and, I, and I'm just like. This is an access platform for a reason, and I get very frustrated when I see. I know it's hard to judge in today's in today's society because obviously um, there's people with hidden disabilities as well, which are of, co of course entitled to be there. But there's also other situations where I'm like, okay, you definitely should not be on this platform, um, and I think we probably at some point all come into contact with with people like them, haven't we? <laughs> yeah not ideal um let's talk a bit about other types of music events and, and gigs then because there is a difference isn't there between um music events that are in an arena indoors compared to like a festival so have you guys been to uh sort of outdoor festivals as well molly i'll start with you yeah so i've done um big weekend for the last two years through the BBC Big Weekend doing it again this year and I've also done Leeds Festival last year um obviously Big Weekend is like a you stay in a hotel and you kind of come in each day whereas Leeds is a camping one and Leeds honestly was surprising it was amazing in terms of accessibility there was like changing places there was hoists there was fridges if you needed them for medication there was wheelchair charging facilities um the disabled campsite you can have four people that can camp as well so you don't have to just be with your carer um and again even in the arena as well like when the, sort of you were listening to music there was changing places toilets inside the actual um camp and everything it was i was on i was quite nervous about going i was excited but i was thinking the accessibility is just going to be absolutely horrendous um but it was honestly amazing it was one of the best accessibility experiences i've had um at leeds festival it was oh. yeah, amazing so good i love how we're like actually in shock like these are I things i was that so in shock i know <laughs> Like we should, we should just like, you know, most people will go to a concert and that is just yeah expected. But for us, if something's amazing, it's a shock. It's like, oh my God, this is, Ooh. this is different. We need to, we need to, to yeah. praise it and shout. I think they had it. like, they had three or four different toilets on the campsite. So it was almost like as well, it was, 
if you had particular needs, you could pick the toilet or the shower that kind of fitted best to your needs as well. So it wasn't just like there was one there for everyone. They had different sizes, different um, like ways to transfer onto the toilet, things like that. It was, yeah, shocking, but really, really good. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, that... I mean, when you think festival, you think Portaloo. You don't often think changing places. Really? So that is great to hear. That's really cool. Yeah, it's really good. Jordan, what about your festival experience? Have you been uh, rolling around in the mud? <laughs> I've definitely not been as successful as that. Um, I'm often put off by the lack of accessibility, um, camping, tournaments, and all of that. Um, so I chose a festival that was local to me, and I drove home each night, so we could have our own bed. Um, but still, that wasn't ideal, because I would have to spend all day not going to be public, or monitoring how much I'm drinking that day. It wasn't bad as I at all. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you had a great experience. Never. Yeah. Yeah. I Because, again, the more well known sort of iconic festivals you hear about, like Glastonbury and places like that, I guess from what we've seen online and stuff in terms of access, you think it's a wheelchair user's nightmare for the mud. And I know a lot of it comes down to the weather on the day that none of us can predict. But, um, yeah, this was actually one of the questions that we have had come in from one of our community listeners today. Um, it says, festivals are known for being muddy. How will my wheelchair cope? So from the sounds of it, Molly, it sounds like you're the, the festival pro out of all of us. Um, what advice would you give for a wheelchair user in these big outdoor festivals? Um, currently I've never been to a festival where it has poured it down for a weekend. I'm definitely jinxing it now, but yeah, I never had a festival where it has rained, um, too badly. So I've never sort of had the best experience in terms of like getting around on the mud because I've just never needed to. Um, it rained a bit at Leeds and they had kind of sort of plastic walkways they put down, um, sort of just to get you like to the viewing platform. Um, so if it was raining, you could still get onto them and they were all kind of, they weren't they had like plastic flooring down and tarpaulin and stuff so you could still get over them and the bit where the toilets were as well was all kind of matted so you could still get there um i don't know how it would be if it was proper proper raining because the whole entire festival didn't have that experience but i assume if they're you know they were so good with other things they would have kind of protocols in place that they could adapt to it because yeah wouldn't want to be getting stuck in the mud <laughs> yeah definitely not and with the outdoor festival obviously there's the risk of uneven ground you know you'd like to think that the the landowners have kept the grass nice and short and things like that but obviously it's not always the case and obviously it's festival it's drinks or the amount of empty plastic cups that we see just littered everywhere is a bit of a logistical nightmare sometimes getting caught up in the wheels but um but it's doable it's absolutely doable this isn't like a a doom and gloom thing i i know personally i've been to v festival back in the day a couple of times absolutely loved it um yes been there a few times when it rained but it wasn't enough to you know really affect my wheelchair and i had an umbrella prepared so i was i was all right i'd probably say my i touched on it at the very start in our little quick fire round the worst festival i ever went to was a local festival that was just it was completely muddy i I found my position in the field and I stayed in this one position for the whole day. Like it was one of these that I wanted to move around because they had, you know, a tent over the other side of the field that was like a silent disco or they had different stages. I couldn't move. Um, but I made myself known to the staff and in fairness, the staff were amazing and they actually, they actually brought a set of headphones from the silent disco over to us in the field and the signal just about reached so we were able to have us we were the only ones having a silent disco in the main arena because we couldn't move which was quite quite a unique experience um but yeah that was probably my worst one in terms of mud i think at one point trying to get me home i had about six men carrying my wheelchair which for some people would probably be a dream but it was just an absolute hell for me like yeah and my mum wasn't too happy when I got home with the uh with the mess shall we say <laughs> talking of festivals as well another question which we've had come in from one of our listeners they've been asking for advice on camping now 
Jordan, I know you've already said that you you pack up and you go home. I think you're like me, not a fan of the camping. My advice, don't do it. <laughs> but Molly, it sounds like you have done a bit of festival camping by the sounds of it. So you're probably best equipped to answer this one. Yeah, I've only done it once. As I said, big weekend, we've always just stayed in hotels. Um, the Leeds Festival, we did do it. It wasn't the comfiest sort of four nights you ever spent. It was fun. I didn't think, yeah, it wasn't like the most amazing experience. I don't particularly need hoisting and that I'm quite light and someone can just kind of pick me up. And as I said, because you can have three other people with you, there's kind of a lot of hands available to help you. So for me, we just bought like a quite a high up inflatable bed. So it wasn't, they were having to lift me onto the floor. Um, and then the three people that I was with kind of just sort of lifted me out of my chair and kind of dragged me into the tent. So it worked. It wasn't, as I said, the most you know, comfy, easy four nights sleep of my life, but it, it works. Like there's ways around it. Um, and then it would be have to, someone would have to sort of drive my chair to the um, charging tent where I could get charged overnight and things like that. Um, and then bring it back in the morning. But yeah, it, we made it work. It just, I think they um, potentially offer portable hoists. I think as well, I saw somewhere they do that. Um, I haven't used them myself, but I think it is an option that they can help you provide or help you look for where you can rent one from as well. So something else to, keep in mind in terms of actually getting into the tent brilliant yeah no yeah. I, I find it find it interesting i've never never been interested in the camping aspect of um music events i'm very much <laughs> book a local hotel or come home yeah. if i can um jordan you're laughing there i presume that's a similar situation for you definitely until they make tents so that i can slide into them and they've got electricity and heating you won't catch me camping. Yeah, it was a very cold for your night's sleep, actually. It was the middle of August, but I've never been as cold in my entire life. Honestly, it was <laughs> freezing. <laughs> so when it comes to accessibility at events, who do you guys feel is most responsible for making sure it's inclusive and accessible? Because I know there's a bit of conversation around, you know, should the artists themselves be aware of these things and only agreeing to do venues that are well equipped for and can cater to everyone or is it the venues themselves that need to up their game i know one artist in particular this is kind of sidetracking from music but it's still a live event but um i know comedian rosie jones has been under a little bit of fire um because being a disabled woman herself I think at various points in her career, she's done gigs at venues that are typically not very accessible, which you wouldn't expect from someone with a disability themselves. So, Jordan, I'm in, I'm intrigued to know your opinion on on you know the responsibility of making these accessible improvements. Who does it line with? I think we've all got a bit of responsibility. The venues, if they can make them accessible, they should. I appreciate that some can't. And um, just must have built all the advice these perform for. Or, but also, I think it is good when artists are mindful of their audience. Our uh, young lad has got this year that he's doing it in his own little festival today. And he's had a whole separate ticket section for wheelchair users. There's a platform section, but there's a, an accessible area that hasn't got a platform section. And that conversation has been something that you've talked about publicly. And I think that is so impressive to see um yeah i think if everyone's responsible to the other yeah no it is really refreshing to hear actually um because yeah we we don't see it enough isn't it i guess the artists are not always responsible for booking their own venues you know they have managers and promoters and whatnot but when you actually see an artist heavily getting involved in this like you said with young blood it's it's very refreshing to see i i like the sound of that are you going to the Young Blood Festival? I am. You are. <laughs> Love that. So it's it's like an all is it an all day thing where it's it's like, just him all day. <laughs> it's an all day thing, but he's picked up some slightly smaller artists that are up and coming, and he's the headline that one. Amazing. Oh, sounds good. We look forward to seeing your pictures and videos of that one. Uh, guys, kind of just to summarize, you know, we, we're talking about um, music, live events. Um, we've talked about the, t the the ticketing process itself. We've talked about actually accessing the venue in terms of parking, toilets, 
um, things like that and, and limited views and platforms. Um, is there anything else that kind of springs to mind for you guys in terms of accessibility that you feel like needs special mention or any particular improvements? Molly, is there anything that jumps out for you? I think I mentioned it before, but potentially if there are cases where you have to phone up to get tickets, um, just things like having potentially more people on the phone lines. I think, again, when it's such a massive artist, um, they kind of have the same level for that massive artist as they would for a smaller artist. And obviously there's a lot more people phoning up and there just isn't the people on the phone lines to answer your call and get you the tickets. And it means quite a lot of time you do miss out on the opportunity to get them. And I think if they just had a few more people on the phone lines, obviously... You wouldn't be waiting in the queue, you wouldn't be having to phone up so many times. Um, but I think it's not really something that's thought about because obviously everyone else can just buy tickets on Ticketmaster and it's really easy. But I think when you do have to go through a different avenue to get them, just having more people at the end of the phone to take your call or answer your email would just make everyone's lives easier from their point of view and our point of view as well. It really would. Yeah. It would. And we've got sort of a final question here, which came from one of our community uh, listeners today who said... Um, and they asked, what sort of top tips would you give for people with SMA or any other disability, somebody who maybe um, has some access needs? When it comes to gigs, Jordan, what sort of top tips would you give? So it's often first come, first serve for disability plus where I was. I would really recommend signing up to your favourite artist email more so that you know exactly when things are going to be on sale. So you can be the first one that's real or the first one that's going wrong. Um, that's just been the, the best thing for the think. Yeah, it's, it's good advice. And we had a response come in to this as well when we put this question out on um, online. And somebody said that their best advice would be to don't be afraid to speak up if something isn't right at the time. You know, for example, I told you guys earlier the gig that I went to this week where people were stood up and you couldn't see anything. Um, one of the members of our group was very proactive in trying to um, get the staff's attention to say, look, what can we do? Where can we move to? What? How can we make this work? So yeah, a lot of people are afraid to speak up at the time, but actually if something's not right, don't sit back and just let it ruin your entire experience um, because not nine times out of ten there is potential for for a fix there is you know a way around these yeah. things so don't don't let it ruin your experience i think it's important as well that we found this if you do have kind of a bad experience at a venue to let the venue know not even in like a complaint way and be like this was the worst thing ever but almost in a way of like a, a proactive way so that they then because they might not be aware of it you know if you've had a bad experience and they might not be right if you let them know and it's how they handle it kind of other people moving forward as I mentioned you know Wembley gave us free tickets to go again because they wanted to show us that that is an experience that everyone has and we just got unlucky and I think by letting them know the experience you've had it helps people moving forward but it also creates more awareness for the venue themselves that they can work on things to try and you know do better next time exactly it's not all about you know just shaming them for the sake no. of it it's it's actually let's work together and let's improve this for for in the future Completely. so and I know today, I hope people are not sort of sat back after listening today thinking, my God, going to access gigs sounds awful. These these three have done nothing but moan. We're, we're having a general conversation where we're sharing, obviously, the our experiences and what, um, what we would like to see improved in the future, just so we can have an equal opportunity to other people who go to gigs. Um, but I want to kind of end on a high with some sort of positive... Um, experiences because going to music festivals uh jordan it is such an incredible experience isn't it i absolutely love it live music is just it makes you feel things that you can't anywhere else um, and just to, to in sharing sort of some positivity being disabled can sometimes be hurt. and i know we shouldn't use that but i've met bands before and the f club this one time um, yeah. I've got signed posters and stuff because I wasn't able to reach the merch area. So sometimes that can be good things for me. I love, I mean, she's met S Club. It doesn't get much better than that, oh, does it? Come on. 
<laughs> Molly, have you ever met anybody? <laughs> um, I've met Holly Humberstone before. The yeah, where her? she came out of the um, off the stage, it was right where the lift was. So we met her, all her, and all her band and everything. And again, got a picture with her and got to have a little chat with her because we just left the same way. Love that. Pretty cool. I don't yeah. know if I should have. I don't know if I actually want to admit who I met, but I um I met Girls Aloud back in the day. What do you <laughs> Yeah, we're talking like way back when it was at the end of a concert right and i was sat in my seat and a security guard came over and said right at the very end you just sit there and wait and i just thought it was part of crowd control i thought he was saying like you wait till the end let the crowd go and we're going to take you through this door so i thought yeah that's fine the concert was over he took us through this side door and genuinely just thought he was taking us out of a more accessible exit and we sat in this random room and then this door opened and they walked in. Couldn't believe it. Yeah. So as Jordan said there, there's definitely some perks. And I feel like the overall atmosphere of music festivals, the the buzz you get from it afterwards, it is brilliant. And although we have talked about some of the negative aspects of it today, um, I think the amount of gigs that we've all been to and the, it just proves we keep going back for more because... It is such a great experience and I I fully recommend it. If you haven't yet been to a live event, make it happen because it is definitely, definitely worth it. Um, just on a final note, guys, is there anything else you, you want to add? Anything you feel like we've missed? I'm just saying, if you're thinking about going to a concert for the first time and we're not really sure um, about the volume and stuff, you can always get in touch with other people growing us in our community. Well, we've got people dotted all over the country now. And I'm sure if you wanted to know our experience, you'd be happy to start it. Brilliant. Yeah, no, that's some really good advice. Uh, well, thank you both so much for uh, taking the time out and chatting with us today and sharing your experiences. I've definitely learned more about you guys. We've got the S Club 7 meeting rocker <laughs> in Jordan. <laughs> and then we've got the Eurovision Harry Styles hater in molly so there we go <laughs> uh guys i hope you do manage to get to those dream gigs in the end i'm sure you will um and yeah thank you so much for being part of today's podcast you've been listening to the living with sma podcast we hope you can join us again next time but in the meantime don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode you can find out more on our website at smauk.org.uk Thank you.